Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well and I hope you've all recovered from last week's case because I know that affected a lot of you. It affected me as well. It was a very heavy one and I just hope that you guys are okay. And today's case, it's not as heavy. I mean, it's true crime, so they're always a little bit heavy, but it's not as heavy as last week's because last week's was was a lot. But today we're gonna to be covering the case of Pedro Rodriguez Filo. And oh boy, is this a crazy one. Pedro is the sixth most prolific serial killer ever. If you look at the list of serial killers with the most proven victims, Pedro sits right at number six. Pedro has been convicted of 71 murders and those are just the murders that have been proven. Pedro himself claims to have over a hundred victims, which is just completely insane. It's like, how does anybody kill that many people? But what is even more insane than that is that Pedro is now a YouTuber. Bom dia, pessoal. Bom dia, bom dia para vocês aí. It's like, how? How are they even released from prison, for starters? But how are they now a YouTuber? And their channel has hundreds of thousands of subscribers and their videos have millions of views. Now, we've done a couple of cases on this channel where a YouTuber has turned into a killer, but this case is the other way round. But on top of all of that, Pedro's crimes are often celebrated. He is a serial killer. Why are people celebrating a serial killer? Pedro is often seen as a vigilante killer who killed for justified reasons. He's often compared to Dexter, which side note, I have never seen Dexter. So don't come for me. I, I know it's a very popular show, but I've never seen it, but he's often compared to Dexter. But the thing is, a lot of his crimes are completely unjustified, but people just seem to overlook that. So yeah, today's case is a crazy one. Buckle up, we're gonna be here for a while, grab a whole snack. And it does get a little bit confusing and complicated at times. And I've tried to make it as simple as possible. So please bear with me. So I'm just popping in here real quick because we do have a sponsor. So thank you so much, Hunter Killer, for sponsoring today's video. So Hunter Killer is a murder mystery subscription game that is delivered right to your door and it lets you investigate and solve a murder right from the comfort of your own home. With every delivery, you'll receive actual physical pieces of evidence, you'll receive audio recordings, video files, case files to help you crack the case and catch the killer. And I love Hunter Killer because it really is probably the most unique game I've ever played. It's not just like any other phone game, laptop game or board game. It's a game that you can just really immerse yourself into. And there's so many times where I actually forget that it's fictional. Like you really do feel like this is a real murder that you have to solve. And that is something that I love because you do get all of these physical pieces of evidence and case files and everything as if it is a real case, but they really pay attention to the little details, which I truly appreciate. And that is truly what makes it feel so real. And it's actually really challenging as well. And it's a really good distraction. And something that I really struggle with, which I'm probably always gonna struggle with, to be honest, is a work-life balance. I always struggle, okay, Danielle, you need to stop working now, like step away from the laptop because I really do truly love what I do and I love researching and I love throwing myself into cases. But given the kind of cases that we do cover on this channel, I've said it many times, it can get very heavy and I do look for distractions to completely distract me from work. And Hunter Killer is definitely one of those distractions because I can completely immerse myself into the game. It's actually kind of challenging as well. So I am really just invested in the game. And I just love that me and Ashley can put on our little detective hats, have a little date night and try and find out who the hell the murderer is. So if you're looking for a new game to play that's really immersive, it's gonna distract you from the world and everything that's going on, but it's gonna get your brain going and is also crime related, then I highly recommend Hunter Killer. And if you wanted to try Hunter Killer for yourself, go to hunterkiller.com forward slash Danielle and use the code Danielle to get $10 off your purchase. Again, that is the code Danielle to get $10 off your purchase. Thank you again to Hunter Killer for sponsoring today's video, but thank you to every single one of you watching right now because without all of you I wouldn't get opportunities like this and now let's jump into today's case. Pedro Rodriguez Filo was born on the 17th of July 1954 or was born on the 17th of June 1954 
We actually don't know. Some sources say it was the July birthday. Some sources say it was June. But then Pedro himself likes to claim that he was born at the stroke of midnight on Hallow's Eve. But uh, he wasn't. He, he wasn't born on Halloween. The thing with Pedro, which we will come to learn as we go through the case, is he likes to bend the truth. And I think him just saying that he was born on Halloween plays into that kind of mythical character that he thinks that he is. So he's either a Gemini, a Scorpio, according to Pedro, or our first cancer. I know, can you believe we've never done a cancer? How many crime videos have I done now and not one of them have been a cancer? Which says one of two things to me. One, all of you cancers out there are just so good and pure and angelic and you don't commit murder. Or all of you cancers out there are just good at getting away with things. It's actually funny because my husband actually is a cancer and he finds it very funny that we've never done a cancer. And Pedro was born in the city of Santa Rita in Brazil. We are in Brazil today. It's actually our first time in South America. And I just want to apologize in advance if I butcher any names or place names please bear with me. I mean, I can barely speak English. I can barely pronounce some of the easiest words sometimes. I get so tongue-tied. And he was born to parents Pedro Rodriguez Sr. and his mother Manuela Filo. Now, Pedro didn't have the best start in life because his dad, Pedro Sr., was a very violent man. And when Pedro's mom was pregnant with Pedro, I'm sorry, it gets confusing because they're both called Pedro. So when his mom was pregnant with Pedro, Pedro Sr. deliberately kicked his mom in the stomach when she was pregnant. And it caused Pedro Jr., who is currently in the womb, it caused serious damage. Because Pedro was born with a misshapen skull and it's thought that he suffered a brain injury. And we all know what they say about head injuries. It's actually very common for serial killers to have a head injury. So things didn't get off to the best start with Pedro. I mean, he's basically born with a head injury and that definitely throws into the debate of nature nurture. Was Pedro literally born to be a serial killer? Was he born to be the man he became? But the environment that Pedro also grew up in was a very tough environment. So again, nature nurture, we're like, which one is it? And I'm not gonna get into nature nurture in this video, we do not have time, but I definitely think it is an element of both when it comes to Pedro. So Pedro grew up on a farm with seven younger brothers and sisters. So this is a pretty big family and the family did struggle to put food on the table, which meant that the children had to go out to work to earn money for the family. And Pedro being the eldest sibling, a lot of the responsibility was on his shoulders to also provide for the family. But that wasn't the only problem because Pedro Sr., like I've already said, was a very violent man, but especially when he drank. Meaning the children would often witness their dad being very abusive towards their mom, or they would even suffer abuse themselves. And Pedro, as a very young child, would often step between his mom and dad to protect his mom and try and make his dad focus his violence on him instead of his mom. Pedro saw it as a huge injustice that his dad would act like this towards his mom. But then Pedro's mom was also a pretty straight disciplinarian and it's said that she ruled the house with a quote, iron fist and a Bible. And she would punish and beat the children if they ever stepped out of line. So violence was a common occurrence in the household that Pedro lived in, but it wasn't only a common occurrence in the house that he grew up in, but it was also a common occurrence on the streets of the city that Pedro grew up in. Violence was a very, very common occurrence in the city that Pedro grew up in. There was drug dealers everywhere operating in gangs, always fighting for turf. So Pedro was literally a witness to violence everywhere. Everywhere he went, there was violence. So it's definitely easy to understand how Pedro did become a violent person himself, because if that is all he is witnessing, like it's no surprise, is it? However, Pedro did often find escape and comfort from his granddad, who he was very, very close to. And his granddad really taught him the ways of the world. He taught him all of the skills that he would need growing up. He taught Pedro how to swim, how to harvest, how to hunt. He also taught Pedro how to defend himself. Basically taught Pedro everything that he thought Pedro would need to survive in the 
streets of Santa Rita. His granddad also taught him how to butcher an animal. He was taught how to slaughter an ox and cut it into pieces and drain the blood. Pedro was also told that drinking the blood of an ox would give him strength. So by the age of 10 years old, Pedro was regularly going out hunting to provide food for his family. So hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea of what Pedro's childhood was like. He had to take on a lot of responsibility at a very young age. He was also growing up in a very tough environment. He was basically not a child, if that makes sense. He had to grow up very quickly. He was also left to kind of fend for himself and he was taught from a very young age that he needed to defend himself. And it wasn't long before Pedro was inflicting violence on others. So when Pedro was 13 years old, you've got to remember how young he is. He got into an altercation with an older cousin. So apparently, I don't know if this story is true because this is coming from Pedro himself. Apparently, Pedro had taken his cousin's horse out for a ride without asking his cousin's permission. And when his cousin found out about this, his cousin was very, very angry. And in retaliation, the cousin punched Pedro in the face. I mean, to be honest, that doesn't seem crazy to me. I mean, if you take my pet without asking, you best believe I'm gonna get angry. But following this, Pedro was filled with rage. He didn't understand why his cousin was so angry with him. He didn't understand what he had done wrong. And Pedro wanted revenge. But he decided he wasn't gonna get revenge straight away. Oh no, he bided his time. He waited for the right moment. So then one day, both Pedro and his older cousin were working together at their granddad's sugarcane mill. So him and his cousin are just in the middle of placing sugarcane through a big press, which is like a big machine. It has two rollers to like press the sugar cane to extract the juice. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. And this gave Pedro an idea. He saw the two big rollers. He saw that these two big rollers basically crushed everything that went in between them. And he thought, hmm, I know I'm going to shove my cousin through the rollers. I know it seems a bit extreme, isn't it? Like Pedro is punched in the face by his cousin. So in return, he decides that he wants to crush his cousin, essentially murdering him. It's definitely a very extreme response. I mean, why didn't he just punch his cousin back? Like, you know, punch for a punch. So Pedro quickly grabbed his cousin's hand and shoved it into the rollers. And his cousin's arm started to get pulled through the rollers. His arm was being completely crushed. Can you imagine how painful that would have been? His arm is literally flat. But Pedro wasn't satisfied with just crushing his cousin's arm. He wanted to completely crush him, his whole body. So Pedro started shoving his cousin from behind, like shoving him, trying to get him through the rollers. But obviously the rollers don't work like that and a human body is not the ideal shape to go through the rollers and the machine got jammed. But Pedro still continued. He grabbed his cousin's head and tried to shove his cousin's head in between the rollers. And he was banging his cousin's head against these rollers over and over again, but it obviously wasn't working. You can't just fit a head through these rollers. So Pedro then picked up a pair of pruning shears and just started hacking away at his cousin, trying to cause as much damage as possible. And they were working in a sugarcane mill. There's obviously other workers around and they alerted their granddad who owns this sugar mill, their granddad comes running in, turns the machine off. And amazingly, his cousin survived this attack. He had a completely crushed arm. He was left with permanent damage. And Pedro said at a later date that he fully intended to kill his cousin on that day. And following this attack, Pedro spent two nights in jail. But when the police asked his granddad if they were going to press charges, his granddad just went no. I mean, Pedro has literally just tried to kill somebody and the family are not pressing charges. But his granddad said that they were not pressing charges because the family needed Pedro. They needed him to go to work to earn money for the family to provide food. So that was it. Pedro was just released. No charges, no punishment. And obviously this is me assuming here, but Pedro probably thought, oh great, I can commit these very violent, horrific acts and not be punished because that is definitely his mentality as we go through the case. Because a year later at just aged 14, 
Pedro was about to commit his first murder. And this all started when Pedro Sr. was fired from his job. Pedro Sr. worked as a night guard at a local school and he would just walk the halls all night, every night, just checking that everything was okay, everything was secure. And he made a pretty decent living from it. He didn't make a lot of money, but it was a pretty decent living. And the family really relied on this living to survive. But one day he got fired because he was accused of stealing. He was accused of stealing food and stationery from the school and the deputy mayor fired him immediately. And Pedro Senior was completely shocked by this. I mean, there was no evidence that he had stolen from the school and he was completely outraged that they would just fire him with no evidence. And Pedro Senior was convinced that it was actually the day guard that had stolen from the school. And Pedro Senior went to the deputy mayor and he was like, please reconsider, it wasn't me. I think it was the day guard, please, please. But not only this, Pedro Senior was unable to find work in another location because he was now branded a thief. So now the family, because they had lost their main source of income, were really, really struggling. And Pedro Junior was really enraged by this. He just thought, this is just so unfair. How can they fire my dad with no evidence? This is a great injustice. I want revenge. So one day, Pedro Jr. went to his granddad's shed. He picked up a rifle, ammunition, a machete, and a tent, put it all in a backpack. Then he went off to camp in the woods that was close to the deputy mayor's house. And I honestly don't know why he had to go camp by the deputy mayor's house. Like I actually don't understand why he did that, but he did go and camp by the deputy mayor's house for some reason. And he was actually there for quite a while, just camping by the house. And he was like hunting for food and everything. Like that bit to me doesn't make sense. So then one day he decided that he was finally ready to carry out his plan. He actually turned up outside the deputy mayor's house. He found a spot just outside of the house and took cover. He pulled out his rifle and just laying waiting. Eventually after waiting for a while, a car pulled up and the deputy mayor was inside. And the deputy mayor stepped out of his car and Pedro just opened fire. The first shot missed the deputy mayor, but the second shot killed him instantly. And then after, Pedro just fled the scene. So Pedro had just committed his first murder and he felt good about it. He felt completely justified. He felt like he had avenged his dad. Now, murder is obviously not the answer, but that was not what Pedro thought. And unfortunately, he now had the taste for murder and he wanted more. So Pedro, still in the mindset of he needs to avenge his dad, sets his sights on a second target. So remember I said that Pedro Senior said that it was the day guard that had stolen from the school, not him. Well, Pedro realized, hang on a minute, he also needs to pay. Pedro believed that if the day guard had just confessed to what he had done, his dad wouldn't have been fired. So Pedro wanted revenge on the day guard. And what was his answer? Murder. And I just wanna point out here, at least I'm not aware, I couldn't find anything, but there was no evidence that the day guard had even stolen from the school. And it's just crazy Pedro's mindset. I mean, you've obviously got to understand that he's 14. So he's not exactly thinking like an adult or rationally, is he? But he is so angry that his dad has been fired with no evidence, yet he is willing to murder another person with no evidence. How is it any different? It's worse. Like seriously, how is it justified in any way? So a month after killing the deputy mayor, Pedro went to visit the day guard at school. Pedro hid in a store cupboard until the day guard shift started. And as soon as the day guard arrived, Pedro cornered him. Pedro pointed his gun at the day guard and said he wanted to talk. From this point going forward, Pedro decided that for every person he was going to kill, he wanted to make sure that he sat them down and told them exactly why he was killing them, like he's some kind of vigilante killer, super villain in a movie. So with Pedro pointing a gun at the day guard, he looked him in the eyes and said, my brothers are starving because of you. Is it fair that you did this? The guard was absolutely terrified. I mean, who wouldn't be? And he was pleading for his life, but it was too late. Pedro had already made up his mind. He decided that the day guard must die. Pedro shot the day guard twice before piling a bunch of furniture on top of his body and then setting it alight. And then again, just like before, 
he fled the scene. So Pedro, at the age of 14, I know 14 has carried out two very brutal, cold, unjustified murders. Because I know his dad got fired and everything, but you can't go murdering people just because you get fired. So Pedro, in order to hide from the police, he flees to Sao Paulo to stay with his godmother. And this is when a new phase in Pedro's life starts. One of many phases, he goes through many, okay? Because when he arrives in Sao Paulo, once he's settled down a little bit, he starts to get involved in a lot of drug and gang activity. And this is also when he meets a woman whose name or nickname is called Booty. Now, Booty was a pretty well-known drug trafficker and local gangster. And it's said that she would use her beauty and influence to attract young teenage boys to work for her. So basically she was a sexual predator because Booty would sleep with these teenage boys. And this is exactly what she did with Pedro. At only 14 years old, she slept with Pedro taking his virginity. And I actually don't know how old Booty is, but she's an adult, I would guess 30s maybe. It wasn't long until Pedro actually moved out of his godmother's house and moved into Booty's house. And he was working as a drug trafficker, drug dealer. He was actually moving up the ranks pretty quickly. I think he became like Booty's favorite. And the other people that worked for Booty, basically the other teenagers, were not happy about this because they were just like, why is Pedro moving up so quickly? Like, why is he getting all the opportunities? Like, I want them. I've been around longer. Given the nature and the environment that Pedro is living and working in now, there was quite a few people that wanted to take him out. So one day, a group of three other boys, teenagers, probably around the same age as Pedro, approached Pedro and said, hey, do you want to go somewhere quiet and smoke some weed with us? So they took Pedro to a nearby lagoon and Pedro started to think, like, this doesn't feel right. Something feels off here. Pedro could see that the other boys were armed, which, to be honest, was not uncommon for the business that he was in and the people that he surrounded himself with. There was just something about the boys, something about the way they were acting. Pedro just didn't trust them. So Pedro pulled out his own gun, pointed it at the three boys, and said to them, drop your weapons. And as soon as the three boys had, as soon as the three boys were unarmed, Pedro just started shooting. He ended up killing two of the boys and the third one ended up in hospital. And it's not actually known if these three boys were planning on killing Pedro. We don't know. But it didn't matter to Pedro. It really didn't. He thought that these three boys deserved to die. And even though murder is never the answer, I am not going to sit here and pretend like I know what life would have been like for Pedro. Like I live in a completely different world and I can understand that in some situations it's like kill or be killed. Not that it's the answer, but I can understand why these things happen. I wish that they didn't, but I can understand that they do. So it's like some of the murders I can understand. They're not right, but I can understand. But they are never justified. And also none of the murders that we have covered so far make him a vigilante. And from that day forward, when he killed two of those boys, Pedro was seen as someone not to be messed with. Someone that will kill without hesitation. And people started to refer to him as Cartridge PT, but they obviously said it in Portuguese. That is obviously the English translation. And that is because his favorite weapon was a sawn off shotgun. However, as Pedro became more ruthless and more feared, he made more enemies. And one of these enemies was a rival gang leader who was a man named China. Now, Pedro saw him as a bully and a cheat. Just overall, not a good person. And I just sometimes think, oh my God, Pedro, have you looked in the mirror? <laughs> I mean, you're killing people. You're no better than any of these people. So one day, Pedro decided he was going to take revenge on China because China was such a bad person, which granted, he probably was, but Pedro is no better. So Pedro carried out a robbery of China's gang. He stole weapons and drugs. And as you can imagine, China was furious. He was a gang leader, rival gang leader. He felt disrespected. He felt cheated. And he just could not believe the cheek of this 14 year old. It's like, who the hell is this 14 year old coming to me as this gang leader and robbing from me? And China, of course, wanted revenge. But China decided that he wasn't going to do anything just yet. He was going to bide his time and wait for the perfect opportunity 
kind of like Pedro earlier on in the story. And we will revisit this because China does end up getting his revenge. So Pedro continued to work for Booty as a drug dealer, drug trafficker. And I think he was Booty's number two at this point. And he had formed a very close relationship with Booty. But this all came to an end when Booty was murdered. Because one day the police had turned up to basically bust Booty because she was a high level drug dealer and shots were fired, all hell broke loose and Booty was shot in the process and she died. And this had a huge impact on Pedro because Booty was his mentor and abuser. Pedro had grown really close to her and he was really affected by her death because he kind of felt like, how can she die? Like she's so powerful. She's this high level drug dealer, gang leader. And with Booty dead and Pedro basically being her number two, he knew there was no one really to protect him. So he flees to stay with family. He went to stay with his aunt and uncle who were living just in another town. And this, when he went to stay with his aunt and uncle, began another phase in Pedro's life. And that was a spiritual awakening. So when Pedro went to stay with his aunt and uncle, they started to tell him that they were practitioners of something called candomblé. I really hope that that is how you pronounce it. And the religion believes in spirit offerings, ceremonial dances, animal sacrifices. Members of this religion that carried out these practices were said to be both spiritually and physically cleansed and that going forward their spirit would be protected from their enemies. Pedro was thinking great that is exactly what I need. I need my spirit protected. I have all of these enemies. Booty has just been murdered. I need protection. Pedro saw Booty as someone that was invincible but she wasn't and he did not want to suffer the same fate himself. So Pedro decided that he was going to join the religion. But to join the religion, this required a ritual. And I've got to warn you, we are going to be briefly discussing animal sacrifices. And I know animal stuff is like a huge no. So if you don't want to hear anything, maybe skip forward two minutes. So at the beginning of the ritual, Pedro had to shave all of his hair off, his head, body, everywhere. He had to shave completely. And then he had to gather gunpowder, seven stringed beans, a black cat, and a coconut with all of the hair from the coconut removed. Pedro was then ordered to kill the cat, drink the blood from the cat, and then cover himself in the remains of the cat. So organs everywhere, blood, guts everything. And then he was to place seeds inside of the cat and then bury the cat. And whilst Pedro was burying the cat, several members of the religion danced around him. And Pedro himself has said that at that moment, he felt himself become possessed. A week after this ritual, Pedro dug up the cat, removed the seeds from inside the cat, which had hardened at this point. And from the seeds, he made a necklace. He then wore this necklace and this necklace was supposed to protect him from from any of his enemies. It was supposed to protect his spirit. And from this moment forward, Pedro fully believed that he was invincible. He was convinced that knives wouldn't harm him, that bullets would not pierce his skin. Going forward now, Pedro was not scared of anything because even though he wasn't really scared of much before, he was still scared of dying. But now he thought that he was invincible. I feel like I need to pause for a second because a couple of years have gone past um, and Pedro is 16. It's so crazy. He's a child. He's already killed four people by the age of 16. But not only has he killed four people, he has enjoyed it. He has got enemies everywhere. He's got enemies of very powerful, dangerous people and he's 16. And after the ritual, Pedro's confidence only grew. And now Pedro had decided that he was a defender of the weak. Pedro basically believed that he was Robin Hood. He would hijack food trucks and feed the poor. He would burn down businesses, of basically gangs, you know, the businesses that are just a front for drug and gangs and stuff. He would burn down those businesses that were taking advantage of other people. He would kill men that harmed women. And I don't condone murder or violence or whatever, but all of the hijacking of food trucks and protecting the vulnerable, protecting the poor, giving to the poor, 
I think we can all get behind. They are the only crimes, in my opinion, that are vigilante, protecting people from the gang members and stuff. Everything else, not vigilante, but that's just my opinion. But Pedro himself fully believed he was a vigilante killer and he thrived in this role. And I just think, what makes Pedro the judge? You know, like what makes him literally the judge, jury and executioner? What gives him the right to essentially decide who lives or dies? And I just want to point out that Pedro, even though he's doing this vigilante stuff and he's doing all this Robin Hood stuff and everything, he's still operating in gang activity and he's still living the lifestyle, the very lavish lifestyle that comes with that. So is he really the hero that everyone makes him out to be? I don't think so. So Pedro continued to move around. He didn't stay in one place for too long because he had so many enemies. And he ended up in Rio and this is where he meets a woman named Maria Olympia. And Pedro soon fell in love with Maria. And it wasn't long after that she fell pregnant. So things are, in Pedro's mind anyway, things are great. He's met the love of his life. She is pregnant. He's still living this avenging, Robin Hood kind of lifestyle. But this would all come crashing down for Pedro because one day when he returned home, he found Maria on the floor covered in blood. She had been murdered as well as their seven month unborn child. And on the wall written in Maria's blood were the words, we will get you. And Pedro was absolutely devastated and heartbroken. I mean, the love of his life, but his unborn child has been murdered. And he was like, who the hell did this? And at this point, Pedro didn't have a clue who did it because he had that many enemies. But Pedro swore to himself that he was going to track down whoever did this and get revenge. Over the next year, I know, a very long time, Pedro went round to all of his enemies, torturing and murdering people to try and get answers on who did this. But after a year of trying, he had still gotten nowhere. And then all of a sudden, Pedro was in a bar drinking when a young woman approached him and she was the ex-girlfriend of a gang leader called China. Remember China, the rival gang leader that said he would get revenge on Pedro one day? Well, this young woman said that it was China who had ordered the murder of his pregnant girlfriend, Maria. China had been biding his time, waiting for the perfect moment to get revenge on Pedro. And he finally decided that the perfect revenge was killing the love of his life with his unborn child. And Pedro was outraged. He was so annoyed at himself for starters because he was so annoyed that he hadn't realized that it was China. He had been looking for the person responsible for this for over a year and he was annoyed that he hadn't realized this himself. And as you can imagine, Pedro decided that he was gonna get revenge for this and he was going to murder. China. So first Pedro needed to track down China. He needed to find out where he was and he soon found out that there was going to be a wedding the following weekend and China and China's whole family were going to be at this wedding. And Pedro did not hesitate. He recruited two of his friends, made sure that they were fully armed and they all turned up at the wedding. When they arrived at the wedding, they were greeted by an old man who asked them who were they. And Pedro said, I am an honored guest of China. I believe the most awaited guest of the night. Pedro then spotted China. He barged the old man out of the way, pulled out his sawn off shotgun and just opened fire. He first aimed at China, hitting him in the chest and killing him instantly. But Pedro did not stop there. All of China's family were there and also gang members of China's gang were there. These men worked for China, therefore they were equally guilty. Pedro vowed to kill every man at that wedding. He did say that he was not going to harm any women and children because he believed that they were innocent, which I just want to point out, like, not every man at that wedding was a part of the gang, had anything to do with anything. They were innocent. Again, how is this vigilante? So Pedro, along with his two friends, just started shooting indiscriminately. And there was chaos at this wedding. People were screaming because there were three people just indiscriminately firing shots 
everywhere, but Pedro didn't care. He was just calmly walking around, shooting as many people as he could. Pedro ended up killing seven men that night and wounded 16. And when him and his two friends were done shooting everyone at the wedding, they went to the bar that was at the wedding and sat down for a drink to celebrate. So after this wedding massacre, the heat was really on to catch Pedro. I mean, of course it was. He's just killed seven men and the police were on his tail. And on the 24th of May, 1973, when Pedro is just 18, I know he's still incredibly young. How many people has he killed? And he's only 18. I think it's very easy to forget how young he is when he's doing all of this. When the police catch up to Pedro to arrest him, Pedro didn't come quietly and a huge gunfight broke out and Pedro did get shot and wounded in the process. I don't exactly know how many times he got shot, but he did and he passed out. And when he woke up, he woke up in the hospital surrounded by news reporters. Apparently the media were having quite the field day because they had clocked onto Pedro and his killing spree and everyone was calling him Cartridge PT. And the media were also fascinated with Pedro's claims that he was a vigilante killer. Pedro had always claimed that he had only killed for righteous reasons and because of this Pedro ended up all over the news. Pedro was then sent to court to face up to his charges. The whole thing was a media fiasco and Pedro was being charged with 18 homicides and when Pedro found out that he was only being charged with 18 he was outraged. He turned around in the court and said to everyone there, the reporters, only 18, it can't be as little as 18. I've killed over a hundred men. Pedro was actually angry and annoyed that he was only being charged with 18. He wanted all the credit and the glory for 100 victims. I mean, that's what he claims anyway. And in the end, Pedro was only convicted for 14 murders and he was sentenced to 126 years in prison. And at this point, people thought, great, he's been arrested, sent to court, convicted, and now he's been sentenced to 126 years. His killing spree is finally over but they were wrong. So we all know by now that Pedro only likes to kill, quote, bad people. And what kind of people are in prison? Bad people. Pedro had no intention of slowing down. He relished the idea of going to prison. Now, Pedro was pretty notorious. A lot of the people in the prisons knew who he was. A lot of people didn't like him. A lot of his enemies were in prison and a lot of people wanted to kill Pedro. So he was given the option for protective custody where he would be kept away from the other prisoners and kept alive essentially. But Pedro turned this down. He was like, I don't want protective custody. I want to go to general population. And Pedro wasted no time continuing on his killing spree because he murdered another person before he even got to prison. When Pedro was being transferred from the courthouse to prison, he was put in a van and he was put in a van with a rapist. Now, Pedro said that he hated rapists above anybody else. Pedro said that he absolutely despised men that took advantage of women and by the time that van pulled up to the prison, there was only one man left alive. And that was Pedro. Pedro had killed the convicted rapist. And when Pedro arrived at prison, he was entering a very tough environment. Brazilian prisons have a reputation of being some of the toughest and most violent prisons in the world. And in the 70s, which is when Pedro is going to prison, they were at their worst. They were overcrowded, unsanitary, uncomfortable, unsafe. There could be dozens of prisoners in a single cell with not even enough room to lie down. Drugs, weapons, and women were often smuggled in. Gang warfare was rife. And the prison guards were either corrupt and they aided all of this behavior, or they just were unable to control the prisons and could do nothing about this behavior meaning that the inmates were kind of left 
to govern themselves. Violent outbursts were a common occurrence daily. Deaths were a common occurrence almost daily. Gang wars would often leave other prisoners decapitated or disemboweled. So pretty tough conditions, like some of the toughest conditions imaginable. But to no one's surprise, Pedro thrived in these conditions. Pedro arrived at the prison with a huge target on his back. I mean, a lot of the prisoners hated him because they were enemies of him, rival gangs and everything. But a lot of people also didn't like Pedro because Pedro had this almost celebrity status, this vigilante killer, this person that would kill without hesitation. And other prisoners almost saw this as a challenge. Pedro was ambushed by five other prisoners that wanted to make an example of him. They quickly surrounded Pedro for the attack. However, they seriously underestimated him because by the end of the fight, three out of the five that had ambushed him were murdered. Pedro had murdered three of them and seriously injured the other two. And from that day going forward, Pedro was known as a legend. He became someone that no one would mess with. And a lot of people tried to keep their distance from him because they knew that he would kill without hesitation. But even though everyone tried to avoid him, his killing spree did not end. Over the following years, Pedro murdered 47 people. You heard that right, 47. He would usually carry out these murders with homemade knives or with weapons that had been smuggled in. But other times he would literally just break people's necks with his bare hands. Pedro had made himself judge, jury, and executioner. Pedro would often target criminals who were rapists, pedophiles, anyone that targeted women and children. When you hear this, when you hear the kind of people that he's targeting, you can understand how he got this reputation of being a vigilante killer, you can. But then he also murdered someone in prison because they were snoring too loudly. And then another time Pedro murdered someone because he caught someone spying on him during a conjugal visit, which yeah, creepy, yes. But both of those, not vigilante killings. But this did not stop Pedro being celebrated in the media. It's just crazy. Pedro literally became this mini celebrity. I shouldn't even say mini. He was literally a celebrity and he became the most dangerous and feared man in Brazil. And of course, Pedro is like a lot of serial killers. He loved his newfound fame. Pedro regularly received fan mail and love letters. And he also received several marriage proposals. But not only that, Pedro was receiving requests from the public to carry out hits on other prisoners for them. So what, Pedro is a hitman now? And unbelievably, he carried out some of these hits. If he believed that the person who was requesting the hit was genuine and their story was genuine, Pedro would kill that inmate for them. Do you know how many innocent people are in prison? What gives Pedro the right to decide if someone is innocent or not? Like what gives him the right to take away someone's life? It's just completely unbelievable. It is, and I just don't understand why he is so celebrated. There was also an incident where Pedro murdered one of his friends in prison. And this story might get a bit confusing, so please bear with me. Because honestly, this story that I'm about to tell, I have condensed it, but this could be a video on its own. So Pedro's friend was a man called Claudio and they had become very good friends in prison and Pedro had vowed to protect Claudio in prison and eventually Claudio was released from prison and Pedro said go stay with my grandmother if you've got nowhere to live go stay with her she'll put you up so Claudio went to stay with Pedro's grandmother got to know Pedro's family and ended up starting to date his sister. And then one night there was a little family drama, a little bit of an altercation, and Claudio and Pedro's brother got into a little bit of an argument. Both of them pulled their guns out. Claudio went to shoot Pedro's brother, but missed and actually shot Pedro's sister instead killing her. So now Claudio had killed Pedro's sister, he was sent back to prison for this, and he was sent to the same prison as Pedro. And when he arrived, Pedro said to him, listen, I know it was an accident, I forgive you. And Claudio was like, oh God, 
thank God, because he knew that Pedro killed without hesitation. However, Pedro had not forgiven Claudio because a short time later, Claudio was just in his cell. Pedro entered his cell, walked up behind him and just started stabbing him repeatedly in the neck. Pedro continued to stab Claudio in the neck until his head had been completely decapitated. And then Pedro just left the cell, left Claudio there and went back to his business. Pedro left happy knowing that he had avenged his sister's death. And this is what Pedro's life was like in prison. He pretty much could do whatever he wanted. He could kill anyone he wanted and he got away with it. No one even said anything. But then Pedro got some news in prison that would change everything. It would have a huge impact on him. So one day he was called into the prison guard's office and they said that they had some news about Pedro's mom. And Pedro thought that this was very weird because he had literally seen his mom in person just that morning. Pedro's mom visited Pedro regularly. She went every single week and he was just like, well, if there's any news about my mom, surely she would have told me herself. But then the prison director informed Pedro that his mom had been murdered. She had been stabbed to death whilst she slept. But the shocking news wasn't over yet because they knew who had murdered Pedro's mom and it was Pedro's dad. Pedro Sr. Pedro's dad stabbed his mom 21 times. Pedro was just absolutely floored by this news because he was just like, how can my dad kill apparently the woman that he loves? Pedro was allowed to visit the morgue and he stood over his mom's body and he made a vow to himself. He promised his mom that he would avenge her death. He would kill his dad and eat his heart. So Pedro Senior was convicted of the murder and can you believe it? He was sent to the same prison as Pedro. It's like, come on, we all know what Pedro is like by now. Like send him to another prison. And Pedro Senior was placed in a different part of the prison on purpose because they knew that Pedro Junior wanted to kill him. But I think we all know what happens. Pedro pretty much runs this prison and he does whatever he wants. So one day Pedro says to a prison guard, oh, I'm not feeling too good. Like, oh, I'm not feeling well. So the guard enters Pedro's cell and Pedro then threatened this guard at knife point, told the guard to hand over his gun and his keys. Pedro then used the gun to round up all of the other prison guards and he locked them all in his cell. So now Pedro has free reign of the prison. There are zero prison guards around. Not that I think that they would have stopped him anyway. And Pedro knew exactly what he was going to do. He makes his way to his dad's cell. When he arrives at his dad's cell, he points the gun at Pedro Sr. Pedro Sr. made no attempt to run or hide. It's almost like he knew what was coming and he had resigned to his own face. Pedro Sr. then looked at Pedro Jr. and said, you are right, my son. Pedro then launched himself at his dad. He dropped the gun and wrestled his dad to the ground where he stabbed him 22 times. Pedro stabbed his dad one more time, then Pedro's dad stabbed his mom. Pedro then kept to his word and got his knife and cut out his dad's heart. He had vowed to his mom that he would eat his dad's heart. So Pedro proceeded in taking a bite out of his dad's heart, but the heart was too tough and chewy and Pedro couldn't actually eat it. So he just spat out the remains on his dad's body. And then he just calmly walked away. He walked back to his cell. He let out all of the prison guards. He then allowed himself to be handcuffed and taken away. So that was very intense. And that is probably the most infamous killing of Pedro. However, one more very significant thing was going to happen until Pedro's killing spree actually does come to an end. So according to Pedro, this all started because another prisoner had started a rumor about Pedro's friend. And then because of that rumor, Pedro's friend was murdered. And Pedro was absolutely furious about this. He blamed the inmate that started that rumor 
before his friend's death and Pedro swore to take vengeance out on this inmate. The prisoner that had started this room out was a transgender inmate and in the prison that Pedro was kept in, the transgender inmates were kept in a separate part of the prison and Pedro decided that he did not like any of the transgender inmates. So he decided that he was going to storm into the transgender section and just kill kill as many people as he could. And tragically, this is exactly what he did. And by the end of his rampage, he had killed 16 prisoners. Now this incident was horrific enough to actually force the prison to do something about Pedro. They had decided that enough was enough. Like he was killing too many people. Pedro was then sent to a psychiatric ward and he was ordered to not have any contact with any other prisoners. And this is exactly what I mean when I say that Pedro is not a vigilante killer. He has purposely gone into the transgender section of the prison to kill inmates just because they're trans. So please tell me, how is that a vigilante killer? Pedro has spoken about this incident later on to a reporter where he said, quote, gone crazy killing insert derogatory word because I won't say it. And then he also said that he was deaf for three days after this because of the screams of the prisoners that he was murdering. And for some reason, the fact that he has just killed 16 transgender people just because they're trans gets glossed over. No one wants to focus on it because it doesn't fit the vigilante narrative and it makes my blood boil. Everyone wants to forget about this because everyone just wants to celebrate him. Oh, Pedro only kills bad people. I'm sorry, he doesn't. He has now been sent to a psychiatric ward. He was evaluated and they deemed him to be a psychopath. Shock. Horror. They said that he was incapable of feeling remorse and he was then ordered to live in complete isolation under maximum security and he was not allowed to interact with any other prisoners. From 1992 to 2002, pretty much the whole time Pedro was in his 40s, he was completely isolated. He spent pretty much 23 hours a day in a cell on his own. He was only ever allowed out to do a little bit of exercise every day. And even then he was always accompanied by two prison guards who were ordered to shoot and kill if he ever stepped out of line. Pedro spent most of his time reading, exercising, playing solitaire and repeatedly punching a bag of sand. And believe it or not, the isolation actually worked. After 10 years of being completely isolated, Pedro was let back into general population and he never killed again. Which I've got to say, this is definitely the first time I have ever heard of isolation working. I have only ever heard of isolation having a negative impact on people, but apparently in Pedro's case, it worked. And then in 2007, Pedro was released from prison all together. I know, can you believe it? What the actual hell? At this point, Pedro had been convicted, convicted of 71 murders. And of course, his sentence kept getting longer the more people he killed. And his cumulative sentence was 400 years. 400 years, how has he been released? Well, apparently at this time in Brazil, there was a law that said no prisoner could spend more than 30 years in prison, regardless of what they had done, regardless of their prison sentence. So that was that, Pedro had served 30 years and he was released. It's just crazy that someone that has committed 71 murders and is thought to have committed a lot more, possibly into the hundreds, is just released. And he actually did get rearrested not long after he was released and he spent a few more years in prison. He was rearrested due to some crimes that he committed in prison, nothing outside of prison. And then in 2017, at the age of 63, he was released for good. But the story doesn't end there because Pedro now has a YouTube channel. Bom dia, pessoal. Bom dia, bom dia pra vocês aí, tá? It's just crazy to think that one of the world's worst serial killers, because I think it's very easy to forget that he sits at number six of most proven victims of serial killers ever, okay? It's just crazy to think that a serial killer as prolific as Pedro is now a YouTuber. 
How do we live in a world where that happens? So Pedro's friend, Pablo Silva, created a YouTube channel. Pablo helps Pedro make videos on his daily life, just getting a haircut, like what he does in a day. But what I think is absolutely crazy is that some of the videos are actually Pedro giving his opinion on current crime in Brazil. It's just like, what the hell? So Pedro Rodriguez Filo, who is a serial killer with at least 71 victims, now has a lifestyle and true crime channel. The two of them grew the channel to have over 250,000 subscribers and a few of the videos also had over 1 million views. In Pedro's channel trailer, it says, quote, in this channel, you will know and follow the life of the greatest serial killer in Brazil. However, since starting my research, because I've been researching this case for quite a while, like I started looking into this case, it was like December time, the channel was still up and everything. But since I've like been doing my deep dive research in the last few weeks, the channel has gone. The channel has actually been rebranded. It's almost like Pablo has now taken over the channel and completely rebranded it. Like I even looked on Social Blade and you can see that there are videos deleted because millions of views just disappear overnight. It's like, I don't know what happened, but clearly Pablo and Pedro fell out. But anyway, Pedro has since started his own channel just on his own now, where he now has 500 subscribers and he still to this day, posts videos about his life. Like the last video he posted was just a few days ago. So what are your thoughts on this case? This is a crazy one. This is definitely like the most unbelievable case in the terms of he's out. He's one of the most prolific serial killers and he has a YouTube channel. Personally, I think I've made it pretty clear throughout this whole video, but I don't think he was a vigilante killer. I think Pedro was someone that liked to kill. I don't think you can deny that. And given the environment that he was in outside of prison, I mean, he was very involved in gangs and drugs and guns and everything. He just happened to be killing quote, bad people because of the world that he was in. And then he went to prison, which is obviously going to be full of, quote, bad people. And because he liked to kill, he was then also killing bad people in prison, if that makes sense. And then I don't know who came up with it. I don't know if it was Pedro himself or somebody else. Somebody then put this whole vigilante spin on it to excuse what he's doing. I think if this video was purely about Pedro wanting to avenge the murder of his mom, his sister, his pregnant girlfriend, I think we could all understand why he murdered people. I think we could all understand that there are emotions involved. Not that murder is ever the answer, but I think we could understand. But this is a man that made himself judge, jury, and executioner. And he killed people for stupid reasons, like snoring too loudly. And then he also went on a murderous rampage where he killed 16 people just because they were transgender. It's just crazy when you think about it because who the hell has killed 71 people is a serial killer, one of the most prolific in the world, and they are celebrated. So that was the story of Pedro Filo. Um, not a vigilante killer. I'm sorry, you will never convince me that he is a vigilante killer. Mm -mm. And there was a really good book on this case. And I use that book quite a lot for my research. It is a very good book if you wanted to read a bit more about this case because I did have to cut a few things out definitely go check that book out. I will leave a link to it in the description box if you wanted to go check it out. So yeah, please leave me all of your thoughts on this case. Like I really wanna know because I feel like from doing my research, it is 50-50. 50% of the people that know about this case think he's a vigilante, celebrate him, think he's amazing, he's a hero. And then the other 50% are kind of like me and think, hang on a minute, he's killed at least 71 people. How are we celebrating this? He is not a vigilante killer. So yeah, let me know all your thoughts, theories, and opinions. I wanna know, especially on this case, like I wanna know what you all think. Don't forget to leave me your case suggestions in the comments down below. I always wanna know what you wanna hear next. Thank you again to Hunter Killer for sponsoring today's video. And I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.